Good evening everybody, welcome to Friday's Indie Car. Sorry that it's so late today, it's just been a very, very long day and like a lot of people I have to earn a living and unfortunately sometimes earning a living means I can't do the show until quite late on. So here we are on, what is it, Friday the 16th of August. And what's been going on in the news today? Well, I think you'll be aware that maybe two things have been happening in the news today. One of them is that the Scottish Government has now nationalised civilian shipbuilding by buying up the, um, the troubled Fer Ferguson uh, Marine Engineering Yard at, uh, at Port Glasgow. And the other thing that's been happening today, which wasn't really remarked upon except on, on um, social media channels, and that is STV's bizarre reporting of, of the construction of a school in Scotland. Now, if I let me deal with this one first, um, without going into the details of which school it was, STV News reported that a school had been completed in Scotland and made it sound, to, to all intents and purposes, like no schools had ever been completed in Scotland at any other time ever. Uh, it was as if this was a miracle it somehow happened. A school had actually been, a new school had been built in Scotland, as if this was something which just happened once in a generation, as somebody once said. But of course we know that the uh, SNP's school building programme, with its new form of, um, of financing, where they have um, a kind of trust arrangement, where uh, a trust provides the funding to build the school, the school is then leased uh, by the local authority, uh, and that lease is then that lease money is then paid to to the trust. And the nice thing about that is, you know who you're dealing with, and they're not going to you know gouge you for massive profits of, as the PFI project, which both the Labour and the Conservative Party started in Scotland, which has led to so many councils being out of pocket. But what was the issue this morning was the fact that STV are plainly trying to misrepresent this as being the only school that was built in Scotland. It's utter rubbish, as we all know, that the hundreds of schools are scheduled to be built, and over 130, as far as I remember, have already been constructed, including two actually right behind my own house. So this, this thing that's going on with STV is obviously the same disease which has uh, afflicted the BBC, where they can only... Um, minimise everything that the SNP Scottish Government manages to achieve and make it sound as if they're limping along as usual. So again, this is the drip feed of Scotland bad, Scotland the small, Scotland the weak, uh, where we know that we're not any of those things. And in the middle of that, we have a major discovery of oil in the North Sea. 300 million barrels of oil to be pumped from a new field called the Mariner Field. And this at a time when traditionally um, the British government have us believe that oil is running out. As somebody once said uh, that scientists were baffled as to why it was that um, oil coming from Scottish oil fields seemed to uh, somehow shrink away in direct proportion to its proximity to a Scottish independence referendum. And then as soon as the referendum was over, the amount of oil in the, in the North Sea suddenly starts to expand again. So we know that uh, the oil isn't running out and that we have got billions of gallons of oil or billions of litres of oil, if you prefer, the, the metric system. Not to mention all of the oil that's been discovered west of Shetland. So the usual story is coming from the media. OK, but let's, let's focus now on what's happening at Ferguson Marine. As you know, uh, Ferguson Marine was struggling five years ago and the, uh, the Scottish billionaire... Jim McCall, who um, is the man who owns Clyde Blowers, which is a massive multi-million uh, pound company, which invests in all sorts of industries. Um, Clyde Blowers is a bit of a misnomer, really, because it invests in so many other things apart from blowers, which nobody really seems to know what they are. Presumably, they're some kind of fan. But anyway, that aside, um, Jim McCall invested in this firm, modernised it, and started to build ferries. Now, the ferries that were being built, and still are being built at Ferguson Marine, are new types of ferries, not been done before. They've already done a couple of roll-on and roll-off ferries which have electric drive motors <coughs> and are capable of being recharged by their diesel engines. So they have low-carbon roll-on, roll-off ferries already successfully launched and running and in operation. 
So you'd think that, you know, from that point of view, they've already kind of blazed the trail. And so creating these new ferries for the, the Hebrides, these larger ferries containing, you know, much more passenger accommodation, larger enclosed car decks, far more seaworthy, um, seagoing type ferries capable of dealing with much larger wave heights and, and more severe weather, that it would be a relatively simple, relatively simple ask. Uh, to construct these two new ferries at the price that was quoted. But it seems that that wasn't the case. And for some reason, the intermediary company, which the Scottish government had, I think, unwisely created as a sort of arm's length um, customer, if you like, they created a sort of pseudo company, which would uh, ask the ferry company to build a ship with the certain specifications that came from this company, uh, CMA, I think it was called. Anyway, whatever this company was, it kept changing the specifications. So as the ship was built, it kept asking for change after change to be made to the design of the ship. And anybody who knows anything about building ships knows that once you start changing one thing in the specification, a whole lot of other things have to change as well. Well, that slows it down. Anyway, the practical uh, result of all of this is that the ship couldn't, be, or the ship, two ships could not be built for the £97 million price tag. And therefore, Ferguson's uh, had to basically stop working on it because they were running out of money and the number of design changes weren't practicable with uh, the way they had priced it. So they, they got into trouble and they were about to uh, appoint um, administrators to basically administer the company while they looked for a new buyer. The Scottish government realised there probably wasn't going to be another buyer who was capable of bailing the company out and finishing the two contracts and so the Scottish government has come in and has taken the country under its wing. So the Scottish people, if you like, now own Ferguson Marine and also own the customer company Caledonian McBrain which operates ferries on behalf of the Scottish government uh, around Scotland. Now. I don't know about you, but I'm old enough to remember when a lot of industries were nationalised and although people complained about this sometimes, that the amount of money that was being put in to subsidise these companies, they did at least provide employment for thousands of people. The prices for uh, and fare structures of these companies were much easier to deal with for everyday people. There weren't massive uh, costs increases, there wasn't a constant rise in fares. Uh, and there wasn't a massive profit taking that you get from private industry. So if you think about this now, Scotland has its own shipyard, its own civilian shipyard, which is capable of making the most cutting edge new low carbon civilian ships. And it's probably the only yard of its kind anywhere in Britain that can do this. Not only that, but it owns a company, or we own the company, which runs the ferries as well. So. Where you have two companies which effectively are owned by us, the taxpayer, it would probably make a lot more sense for all of civilian shipping in terms of construction and operation of ferries to be amalgamated together. So the building of the ferries, design and building of the ferries and the operating of the ferries is all done by one larger company perhaps. That would streamline everything. It would mean there would be no client, uh, client and um, and supplier anymore. There would just be one company which could talk to itself. So it would know, for example, what the ferries needed, what size they needed to be, how fast they should go, how maneuverable they might be, how heavy they should be, and what the features should be, what the engines should run on, and so on. And that is much easier to do when the people designing the ship and the people building the ship are members of the same team. Instead of this ridiculous process of tendering for things and getting them to bring them in at the lowest cost and then adding complexity to the ship as it's being built so it can't be built for the cost originally devised. So as far as I can see this is a brilliant way of dealing with the problem of building new ferries and also building other kinds of shipping as well. I've spoken many times in the past on this show and also in some of my blogs about the fact that I believe Scotland should be at the cutting edge of developing far more low carbon shipping and not just passenger ferries either. I'm talking about uh, coasters, the kind of vessels which take raw materials around the coastline 
uh, of the United Kingdom or around Scotland or around Ireland or up and down the coast of Europe. Short range ships which are basically taking raw materials from one place to another don't have to be huge but they do need to be cost effective and the idea of running uh, electric ships or low carbon ships or sail assisted electrically div driven ships perhaps with solar uh, panels as well all of these things could be developed with a big nationalized company like the one I'm thinking about and the Scottish Government has on its doorstep at the moment the opportunity now to do something quite remarkable and to create a nationalized industry which is not just making ferries but is actually devising methods uh, for creating low carbon ships of the future for all kinds of different markets. And that means we could pour money into research and the development of new drivetrains, electric drivetrains, hydrogen drivetrains, solar electric assisted drivetrains, all kinds of different ways of both storing energy uh, and using it to propel ships. Ships, incidentally, that could be made of more high-tech materials than simply steel. We're talking about aluminium ships, carbon fibre, the kind of materials that are usually normally associated with the aerospace industry but work fantastically well when you're trying to build a lightweight, uh, low-energy ship which can move goods quickly from one place to another. So in my mind, this is a good thing. The idea that uh, shipbuilding has been taken into public ownership in Scotland can only be a good thing. When you think about it, um, just about every railway train that operates in the United Kingdom is either made abroad, usually in a European Union country, or is operated by a foreign uh, country's railway company. If you think about that for a moment, because Abelio, which runs ScotRail, is the Dutch national railway company. It's a subsidised, publicly owned company. Okay, it's a nationalised industry. Our rail companies have been broken up into lots of little pieces now because of the Tories privatising everything. And all that's happened is prices have gone up and you cannot get a ticket that takes you from one place to another without having to buy multiple tickets from multiple companies. And this was always the problem with the railways. It is high time, I think, that the Scottish Railway Network was also taken into public ownership again because... In the new Scotland that's coming, we need to be able to control a lot of the things that we make uh, and that we use and that are vital to the people of Scotland and their, well, for them to flourish, for them to live, go to school, get to hospital. You know, public transport is vital for that. Ferries, aircraft, all kinds of different forms of transport are necessary in a country which has such remotely uh, situated uh, population centres. So, so many people but spread over such a gigantic area. So we need to think carefully about how we do that. Many years ago, at the time of the Act of Union, about 1700, the world didn't work the same way as it does now. Uh, we at the moment have got used to a form of free market capitalism where basically things are made wherever it's cheapest around the world. Uh, and trade is based on growth. In other words, it's based on making more of things, selling more of things to more people in more markets. So it's an ever-increasing uh, market and an ever-increasing uh, growth rate for manufacturing, for money, for everything. But we know that can't go on forever because eventually you use up everything on the planet and there's nothing left to grow with. But back in the same trade to serve uh, people goods, and in mercantilism, which was widely accepted, at, sorry about that, uh, mercantilism was accepted all over the world. It was partly responsible, incidentally, uh, for the failure of the, the, the rather notorious Darien project uh, in 1898, 1899, when the Scottish uh, nobles decided to invest in what was at the time a Scottish colony in Panama. Now, it failed for a number of reasons, but I don't want to go into that. But the problem at the time was that because of mercantilism, the market across the globe was seen as finite. It was a fixed size. So if the Scots wanted to get a bit of the action and colonise somewhere and start trading there, they would have been taking trade from other colonies and other superpowers, like at the time England or, or the British Navy, if you want to call it. But England, Spain, Portugal and other colonising countries at the time would have seen the Scottish Darien project as a threat. And of course they did, 
they blockaded it, they shut it down, they refused to trade with it, and eventually tried to take it by force. But this is where mercantilism comes back again from the dead. At the, the way we are at at the moment on the planet, global trade has come to a halt. We're about to enter a global recession because there isn't any more expansion or growth that can be introduced into the world economy. That's why everything is going to pot, that's why everybody's at each other's throats, and that's why all the trade wars are going on. For Scotland to survive this, we need to go back to a form of mercantilism ourselves. And that means we work with what we have, we don't try to grow. Um, we, we view Scotland and we do an audit of all its resources. As a new country, we audit it all. We look at what we've got, we do a stock take of our oil reserves, our coal reserves, our gas reserves, our marine energy reserves, our, our wind, everything, right? We add it all up so we know what we have to trade. And what we have to do is make sure that our internal uh, infrastructure, such as the railways, the roads, um, internal flights and the links to the islands via ferries and all of that stuff that you need to build to operate that must be under the control of Scotland itself uh, by its government so that those essential things that we really really need for everybody to flourish are always safe they're not going to be sold off by anybody ever again that way we can trade with the rest of the world with what we have and we have perhaps not an infinite amount of um, oil and gas, but we do have an almost infinite supply of marine energy. And we also have an almost infinite supply of ingenuity, creativity, and the ability to make and sell things. We've always been good at it. So I wanted to leave you this Friday with a little thought, having, having worked my way back from 1798 or 1698 to the present time. If we think of uh, the world as having a finite market now, and we go back to mercantilism, that model is the only way that you can sustainably survive on this planet without polluting it anymore and without ripping more of the resources out of it uh, when we really should just leave them there. We have the ability, as I say, because we have endless supplies of solar energy, wind energy and tidal energy, to switch over. So as far as energy is concerned, oil and gas will soon be a thing of the past. We are at a crossroads here. Scotland has a massive opportunity to prepare itself for something completely different. And that would mean a completely new future as a supplier, a massive supplier of gigantic amounts, un inconceivable amounts of energy coming from the massive amount of ocean water that flows around our headlands every single minute of the day. We can channel that, we can funnel it, we can extract the energy from it, and we can sell it. And we can sell it forever, because it will never stop until the moon crashes into the earth, and that's billions of years in the future, incidentally. So, uh, that's about it for today. I just want you to have a think about that. Having the shipbuilding brought into public ownership is a good thing. We've got the ferries in public ownership, also a good thing. If we can get the railways back as well, and start to introduce corporation bus services again by allowing local authorities to run the buses themselves we can bring fares back down we can create thousands of jobs and we take the profit motive away from the vital services that we rely on we get the services cheaper more reliably and they employ more people and we do not have to worry about paying the shareholders of companies that have come in from abroad so although we'd be protectionist a little bit, we'd also have a massive amount to trade. And this is where I see the future of Scotland going. So although this is not really a news programme, I'm looking at the future, but I'm basing the future on something that happened in the past and learning the lessons of Darien, which is in a protectionist world where there's a finite sized market, you need to first of all consolidate yourself so that your own country is safe from harm and that nobody can buy up or strip out any of your essential infrastructure. Then you trade with what you have, and what we have by the bucket load is energy and ingenuity. And that is the future for the Scottish nation, generally, for all of us. And there is no reason why that will not attract more of the 
and smart people from all over the world to come and work here with us to build this kind of country and to build that sort of capability in a very different future from the one that we live in, well, from the present that we live in at the moment. Anyway, that's about it for today. Um, I've got one or two things to say as well, just before I leave you, um, about um, Stuart Campbell's idea for a wings party. It's not going to happen, and it's not going to happen for a good reason. It, it only needed to happen if we don't have a referendum on independence. And I think the likelihood of that independence referendum happening have shot up recently, especially with the complete U-turn that Labour has started to do over both Scottish independence and, interestingly today, Welsh independence. The Labour leadership is now saying they will not stand in the way of Scottish independence or Welsh uh, ambitions to become independent either. The Labour Party now sees the writing on the wall. They're trying to capitalise on it and they're trying to use it to get into power. But at the same time, they have to give us something in return. And the price, I believe, um, of Scottish cooperation with Labour in this should be the Section 30 order and an immediate referendum on independence as soon as possible. Oh, incidentally, and a guarantee that the Scottish Parliament will never be closed by any act of British legislation. A guarantee would be good. Those are the things I uh, was thinking about today while I was working. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed tonight's show. It's been a little different, I know, from normal. But um, well, sometimes, you know, something different is a good idea. Anyway, I'm off home. I will see you guys all later on. I will be back on there again as IndyCar on Sunday at some point. Although Sunday will be a busy day as well. And of course I'll be uh, presenting Scotland at 7 on Monday evening at 7. Uh, and also I'll be back to my usual Thursday slot of Scotland at 7 as well. Thank you very much everybody also for tuning in to Scotland at 7. We're seeing our viewer numbers increasing every week now. And if you haven't heard of Scotland at 7 or you've already watched it and you've enjoyed it, please let your friends know uh, and, get, and encourage them. Uh, to become supporters of Scotland at 7 and Broadcasting Scotland. We're trying to build something exciting at Scotland, uh, at Broadcasting Scotland, and it's just beginning to come together now. OK, I'll see you all on Sunday, and then, of course, on uh, Monday and Thursday evenings at 7 o'clock. Bye. See you later.